So uh, I think we're ready to roll here. So Andrea, you wanna take it away? Absolutely. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining Global Purpose Live. This is a series brought to you by Global Purpose Movement, which is powered by Green Heart Transforms. And I'm just going to give a brief over overview and then turn it over to our interviewee, John, and our interviewer, Emmanuel Kunselman. So thank you for joining us. We have hosted several speakers with Global Purpose Live, including Barbara Marks Hubbard, Irvin Laszlo, Jude Curvin, and today we are excited to host John Delarue. And what we're doing in our session today is asking questions about global purpose movement, how the overall kind of theme of what we're seeing happen across humanity is coming together, which is propelling all of our work forward. And Greenheart Transforms is really honored to be hosting and powering this today's event, as well as the global purpose movement in general. Greenheart Transforms is a part of a organization called Greenheart International, which focuses on cultural exchange, fair trade, and higher consciousness. So thank you very much for joining us. My name is Andrea Dennis, and now I'm gonna pass it over to Emmanuel Kunselman, who will be asking all the tough questions today. So here is Emmanuel, the founder of Greenheart International and our host for today's talk. Over to you, Emmanuel. Okay, thank you, Andrea, and hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Pleasure to be here with Global Purpose Live for our fourth monthly interview. And today we're very pleased and honored to have John Darrell Rue with us. John is the co-founder of Synergy Forum and Bright Alliance. Uh, he also works as a coach and consultant in transformational leadership with individuals and organizations. He's the co-author of the book, Earth is Eaten. Uh, he has a degree in psychology and he lives in Berlin. And I might add, uh, John is a lifelong spiritual seeker and very interested, uh, John, in finding more about your personal path and how you got here today. But first of all, uh, welcome. It's good to see you. Thank you, Manuel. It's a pleasure to be here with you and everyone else. All right. So, John, you want to give us a little background on uh, your own path? Uh, and how it uh, brought you to be with us here today and in a few uh, minutes here. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm happy to. Thank you. So, um, yeah, I, I came into the world with, um, I kind of say it sometimes with my feet already on the path. I feel I, I had a strong sense of the sacred that was present for me from a young age and a very strong draw to connect with um, different spiritual traditions and with a sense that they hold something important for, um, for human transformation and for the possibility of um, coming to find and liberate and bring to expression the potential of every being. So, and that that can be supportive of us building a society and a culture which um, is more inclusive, which brings more safety, care, compassion, wisdom and insight to more human beings, prosperity, better living conditions. So this was always something that was, that was, uh, that was quite strong for me. Um, I grew up in just outside of London in the UK and um, had both uh, somewhat of a challenging family kind of upbringing. There were some hard times there. And um, I feel that's it's really contributed to my capacity to um, to feel empathy, to feel a lot of empathy for the regular experience of a lot of human beings and to recognize that a lot of human beings go through a lot of uh, really challenging times and really challenging experiences on our path. And uh, simultaneously, I um, continue to explore consciousness and what it means to um, explore paths of transformation. And then in my, um, in my twenties, I ended up going to university. I studied psychology. I had a very deep interest in studying 
uh, meditation research, uh, getting into meditation research. I was going to do a PhD, um, taking meditation into prisons. Um, and that's when I went on my first uh, retreat with one of my teachers now, a guy called Bruce Lyon. We went on a retreat to the Egyptian desert, um, so it's, which is an amazing place to have any kind of retreat time. And I had a strong download that happened for me during that time that um, that wasn't the most authentic thing that I really could be doing. That that uh, it was the impulse to do that PhD was coming from a deep place in me, but that um, it was always going to be something that I did before I did what I'm really here to do. And that the kind of the download that came for me there was just just do what you're really here to do and do it now, you know. And uh, so yeah. I, I went back to the UK and said thank you, no thank you to the opportunity to do the PhD and began working um, with projects oriented towards social transformation on the basis of spiritual principles. And um, that's something that's led me over the last six years to working with a number of, uh, a number of projects that I've had great experiences of learning and collaboration with others on. And in the last kind of year and a half or so, that's brought me to work with the Global Purpose Movement and, and your good self and Andrea and, um, and the rest of our team. So, that's been a great privilege for me it's it's um it is a joy a deep joy to uh work with a team of people who i feel so confident in and who i enjoy collaborating with so much and where i feel really i feel really good about what we create together so um yeah that's how i arrive with you now on this call Emmanuel. well very good it's a joy for us to have you with us as well john and we really uh, appreciate the deep, the depth of your spiritual work and uh, the profound insights that you have. Um, and speaking about finding that own deep insight yourself, um, do you have any advice for people as to how to find it? I mean, not all of us can take a spiritual retreat in the Egyptian desert or find a spiritual mentor to help us along. Um, is there any easier way to do this, uh, walking down the street in Chicago, for example? Yeah, sure. So I think there's, there's two answers that I'd have for that. Um, one is I recognize that for a lot of people today, because of, um, kind of really because of the massive flow of information through our lives, people can feel saturated by a vast amount of, um, you know, if they begin to connect to any kind of spiritual teachings or events or pathways, you know, they can feel saturated very quickly by the vast amount that is is out there and on offer to them. And it can feel a bit confusing and disempowering. And um, people often don't quite know what to access first. You know, do they go to a meditation class? Do they do yoga? Do they do, they do something else? Um, so... I mean, certainly part of my, uh, one of my interests is to help, um, help us to develop uh, an understanding of what really contributes to a fully integrated spiritual path that includes um, body, emotions, mind, soul, and spirit as they express in our interior, just our internal life and in our relationships and in our action in the world. I found the integral model of Ken Wilber very, very helpful in being able to give me a sense of, um, of how I can access um, a range of different spiritual teachings or practices that contribute to an overall whole integrated path that can support my development and my growth. Um, so I'd say that, that's kind of about the general broad picture. And then I'd also say, I can invite people to trust their instincts. And so, you know, if they have an instinct to move in a particular direction, whether it's to do practices related to their body or their mind or their soul or you know, some, something that their emotions, you know, um, if that feels really important for them and they have a gut instinct to move in that direction at this time then can i'd say i trust that and um you know we can all have times and seasons for what feels like the most important focus of our of our paths and to the degree to which we really trust and go with what feels right now that will involve a journey that will unfold itself and lead us lead us to the next step and the next step and the next step so yeah in my in my experience often it's a hugely empowering thing um in the work that we do with the global purpose movement and also in terms of working with people on their path generally to um help a person restore a sense of trust in their own instinct their own intuition on what's right for them in terms of their next path whilst also introducing them to 
the fact that there's loads of there's loads of options which um, are filled with some filled with quality. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's fair to say that uh, many of us perhaps get to us distracted by our mental meanderings and our own thinking. You know, we we kind of believe our brain to be in charge, and we forget that uh, we actually have a couple of other physiological brains in the body. One is in the heart, and there's a brain in the gut as well. And uh, both the gut and the heart actually do emit. Uh, all kinds of vibrations, electromagnetic magnetic waves and hormones that they send uh, messages to us. And uh, you know, modern age here, we're so involved in our in our thinking, particularly our left brain analysis, that uh, it overshadows our our gut feelings and our heartfelt feelings. And maybe we all need to get a little bit more in touch with that. Would you would you say that's yeah. the case? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'd agree. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. I think being able to integrate and stay with, be present with the, the insights and guidance that are coming from each of those centers in our bodies is, is really important. And that often we, we live in a culture where we're, we're brought up in ways which tends to preference one or the other and disown some of them. So yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. Well, you've clearly gotten in touch with that yourself, but uh, as you mentioned here, uh, part of your earlier life didn't go all that smoothly, but do you think it's fair to say that in many ways, uh, a little bit of adversity, uh, once you get through it, makes you a stronger character and perhaps even more open to uh, purposeful, let's say, spiritual experiences? Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely, I absolutely feel that. I feel um, often, you know, it is situations of challenge um, and adversity and struggle, which really help to bring the qualities and capacities which are in our being already, but not necessarily expressing to fruition. Um, it's, it's often through uh times when our when our back is against the wall that we have to dig deep and connect to resources that we haven't previously found in our being and that um that help us grow and i i have come in the course of my life to feel more and more that actually even in some of the most challenging situations of suffering there seems to be a there's an intelligence there's there's a compassion there's a love that's there that actually um is giving us the opportunity to bring forth um, new levels of growth and uh, qualities and capacities of our being which are key to our purpose in this life and key to the expression of who we are. You know, I've, I've come to absolutely feel that that intelligence, the intelligence of life, the compassion and the wisdom of life don't just operate through the good times. You know, they, they yeah. also operate through situations of great challenge and great struggle um, to yeah, to bring to fruition who and what we are. So I, I would absolutely agree with that. Yeah. Well, I think that's an important point, you know, because uh, some of the critique of new paradigm thought is, is that it's kind of something for the well-to-do or the uh, people with a lot of leisure time or uh, a little bit more uh, a privileged position in life. And uh, I would say that's not at all the case. And actually that uh, new paradigm thought of higher consciousness and our own evolution towards that is open to everyone. And that actually some people who've uh, uh, had a little tougher lot in life, maybe that makes them better prepared and more open to it and more willing to, to embrace it. I think you're saying the same thing, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I heard the Dalai Lama say something once, which I thought it was, I'd never seen him, I'd never seen so much power come through the Dalai Lama as when I, there's an, there's an interview on YouTube where he says it's the one with uh, Russell Brand. There's a piece where he, he's asked about situations of struggle in his own life and you can feel his resolve um, land very powerfully just before he starts speaking. And yeah. he very firmly and very clearly says, you know, I welcome situations of challenge. I'm a practitioner. You know, they right. bring the opportunity to unfold the qualities that I'm seeking to cultivate in life and to demonstrate greater compassion, um, greater authenticity, greater growth. And 
you know, if we can welcome them um, as opportunities to, as I say, bring to fruition qualities that might not otherwise come to fruition if we didn't face these situations. And actually we can um, learn slowly, often slowly to, to welcome situations of challenge. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, the da Dalai Lama is certainly the, a great example of overcoming adversity and making the most of it. Uh, having had to flee his native homeland in Tibet at a very early age and live as a, a refugee and an exile all his life and, and see that uh, his countrymen and all that have suffered so much uh, after the Chinese invasion. And yet he has always held compassion and uh, for even the Chinese and his, uh, his whole outlook on life. So it's, a, it's an extraordinary example. And, you know, speaking of uh, Tibetan Buddhism, I know that's been a very important factor in, in your life. Um, mm -hmm. If you've been a serious student of Tibetan Buddhist practice, uh, you want to tell us a little bit about that and how it influences uh, your own work and your teaching? Sure thing. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yes, I've had a strong sense of connection to, to Tibetan Buddhism since I was uh, since I was a kid. I, um, for me, some part of it is kind of like my spiritual home. Um, and there's a particular tradition within the Tibetan Buddhist tradition as a whole, a particular uh, school of practice called Dzogchen, um, which uh, has been a very, um, it's just been very deep to my heart ever since I, I first kind of came across it as a teenager. Um, sometimes we come into contact with teachings or pathways that just have a very, they have a very deep impact on us. And um, when I first came into contact with the word Dzogchen, I kind of had this electric kind of just electric movement of recognition go through me. I, I didn't, I didn't know what that was. And yet I know, I knew it was really important for me. And um, yeah, and so, I mean, Dzogchen is Tibetan, it's Tibetan word, it means the great perfection. And it's the understanding that um, in its deepest essence, there is uh, a, an absolute and always pure and sacred dimension of everything. And that the, the ground level of the entire, of all creation is the indivisible unity of consciousness and compassion and life force that is uh, that is arising as everything according to an intelligence that um, that perhaps the mind can never know and can only be felt and fathomed by the heart. And so, um, yeah, Zogchen has been a very deep and key part of my path. It's a, it, it's you know different spiritual pathways and traditions in in my opinion, and they don't all lead to the same place. Um, some of them do, some of them don't. Some of them are oriented towards bringing different aspects of our being to fruition. So, you know, there are some traditions which focus on awakening to the absolute nature of reality. Dzogchen, Tibetan Buddhism is one of those. Um, there are some who, you know, they do that in consciousness. Some of the Middle Eastern traditions, for instance, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, focus on developing a relationship with this absolute reality, which they call God. But there's shamanic traditions which focus on what it means to live in harmony with the earth and each other and you know we have the western psychological tradition as well which is really about what it means to live as a as a healthy and stable individual self and to be able to have healthy and stable relationships and so on and so um Zogchen being about um awakening to the the ultimate nature of things is a is a tradition that you know has a very kind of a democratic ideal in a certain way there's the understanding that this reality, which is um, which they call Buddha nature, is able to be awakened to by anyone because it's simply the nature of what we are, and um, it doesn't take a person thirty years of practice. This is just simply the nature of what consciousness and, and our presence is. So, Zogchen is, is is a very profound but also very simple teaching that's simply about letting our experience be as it is. Um, letting go of the things which block our recognition of the inherent sacredness and unity of all of all life so um sometimes Zogchen is described as the great relaxation so relaxing into our true nature as uh, as as this presence which is um which is knowing itself through everything and and um so i have a very a very strong 
love for this tradition. I've kind of had a love affair with it for, for a lot of my life. Well, that comes through. I, I can feel it uh, even over the computer here. <laughs> so it's a very deep and, and profound practice, has been for, for centuries, and in many ways, uh, some compassion and awakening is just what the world needs today. Have there been any uh, particular teachers in the Zogchen line that have influenced you or any uh, pearls of wisdom or particular pieces of advice from any of those teachers that have really made a difference for you? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, um, there's some, in the history of Zogchen, you know, there's, there's um, amazing, uh, masters, both male and female, um, who lived extraordinary lives of authentic freedom and compassion, intimacy with all with all life, and um, yeah, uh, Padma Sambhava, Long Chempa, You know, there's a number of them. I would I would say personally, my Zogchen Lama, I have a Tibetan Lama, um, um, Prachimba Dorje Kenchen Lama Rinpoche. Um, I have worked with him for the last, um, I guess like five years or so. And, um, I've had a wonderful relationship with him. We have a very close and loving teacher student relationship and witnessing him has been a huge teaching for me, witnessing the way he lives his life. He is a Tibetan man living in Wales. Uh, he's, uh, he's very respected within the Tibetan Buddhist kind of community. And um, he's a Zogchen, a Zogchen teacher, a Zogchen Lama, and he, his mind is genuinely free. His being is genuinely free, and living in the unity of of all life, he is one of the most deeply caring and compassionate human beings I've ever come into contact with. Um, he's very grounded and um his depth of realization is profound and and witnessing him being a father has been a huge impact on me witnessing him um share zogchen teachings with me as he's holding uh one or both of his daughters in his arms and kind of feeding them or playing with them and um witnessing the ordinary groundedness of his life whilst at the same time the extraordinary nature of his awakening and his compassion for everything and everyone that he comes into contact with has been a, a huge teaching for me Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, Pama, Pama Sambhava there, who uh, about 1300 years ago, he, uh, he made that very famous quote about uh, when, the, uh, when horses run on wheels and the iron bird flies, uh, that'll be the time that uh, the Dharma of Sarkin or they probably didn't call it that right then, but the teaching of uh, Buddhism would be spread to the lands of the red-faced individuals. Very prophetic uh, uh, <laughs> statement uh, nearly 1,400 years ago. Um, is, is it the time for the, the Dharma to be spread uh, throughout the world, as, uh, as he mentioned way back then? Um, for the for the geek of Zogchen and Tibetan Buddhism in me, Emmanuel, that's an awesome question. Um, yeah, so I I would I think so yes, and I I would I would understand that what he's what he was pointing to that I mean it's hugely prophetic. It's kind of one of those things where someone you read of some being saying something as you say about thirteen hundred years ago, and it seems so absolutely accurate that you wonder you know how can how can that actually have been the case. Um, I think he's pointing to the possibility of a large scale, spiritually grounded transformative process that um, can happen in the, in the modern world today that um, was not necessarily possible in the same way in his time. You know, that um, we have access to things like uh, the internet and the vast level of global interconnectivity, which is um, the basis of, of so many societies and cultures around the world now that make, um, that make these teachings on the possibility to awaken to the deeper levels of what we are and express that in a way which is of service and um, to our communities, to our families, to our, to our nations, to the world. It's just so much more possible today uh, and it's so much more accessible. And um, so, yeah, and at the same time as, you know, as we both know that 
humanity is facing um, serious challenges today. You know, there are um, extreme situations of, uh, of, of cri actual existing crisis and possible future crisis that we're facing. And, I, and personally, I think just as you and I began this conversation with the, you know, the question around, um, can it be the case for individuals that situations of adversity actually can be supportive of their growth and their path? I think the same is true of humanity that you know we together are in a situation of great challenge right now and um and and real adversity there's, there's vast numbers of human beings who are, who are who are deeply suffering and who you know are experiencing great great challenge um and i think that this can be a, a profoundly transformational time for us as a whole there is that opportunity to bring to actualization qualities of our collective humanity that um that might not be fully born or birthed in this time were it not for the challenge we collectively face or the opportunity to connect to such transformative teachings as as tibetan buddhism or, or um you know all the other many traditions in their in their kind of esoteric core mm -hmm. yeah as our good friend barbara mark hubbard has pointed out many times crisis precedes transformation and yes. um you know the deeper the crisis gets the more creative the solutions or possible solutions that could arise will be. So uh, that seems to be a process of, of nature that helps us along. Um, how do you see the near-term future playing out? How deep is the crisis going to get before we come up with those creative uh, solutions? And how do you feel about this? Are you optimistic for a, a shift in consciousness that uh, help the world become a more peaceful and compassionate place in, in time to uh, ward off deeper disasters? I think it's genuinely, um, it's, it's genuinely in the air right now. You know, it's like, I think it, it really is a situation where we don't know. I mean, I, I know of a bunch of people who have um, very pessimistic views about the future. And I know of a bunch of people who have what seem like hugely optimistic views about the future. And I, I guess my view feels like it falls somewhere in between. Um, you know, I know I've heard Barbara before speaking about the idea that we're currently experiencing both the process of evolution and devolution, that there is um, there's simultaneously the birthing of a new consciousness and a new type of culture among so many human beings around the world that it truly is based on um, love and consciousness and purpose and um, and a deeper level of presence and community. That's absolutely true. And I find myself exposed to that um, increasingly and it's incredibly powerful and inspiring and I'm amazed and enlivened and um, deeply touched by the, the extent and power of, of how much amazing stuff is happening on the planet more and more. And there's simultaneously a process of devolution where it feels like our collective systems um, are, are you know, going through great challenge, to put it mildly, and are you know, really crumbling in certain ways, to put it more strongly. You know, there, there is an increasing pressure that's building up, and simultaneously it feels like aspects of our society are just not able to hold currently, um, and aspects of our social systems, what it, what it requires for us to, to, to develop sustainable and healthy responses to the challenges we collectively face, economically, socially, environmentally, politically. So um, it feels to me that that process may continue, that it may be that there is a, a simultaneous um, coming apart of some of the, um, some of the fundamental uh, structures that have been the, the foundation of our, of our societies and our cultures for, for some time now. Um, you know, in the last six years of doing this work, I've, I've had the opportunity to have a number of conversations with uh, economic experts, people who have played big roles in, in the economic system over the last few decades. And every single one of them has, seen, has told me that they are 100% of the opinion that there will be another economic crash and, you know, that this time the banks won't be able to bail us out. So, you know, and they all, they all just differ about when. That's the only question. And, and whether there can be alternative structures set up in the meantime that can make it um, not such a disaster. So, you know, that's in the economic domain. We know the situation, many of us in the environmental domain. Politically, there's so much going on. You know, this political tension is building up in very inflammatory ways around the world. And, and it's equally the case that 
there is an incredible amount of light and creativity and, and uh, new forms of human culture that are also birthing themselves. So my sense is that will likely continue. And at some point, then there will need to be ideally a healthy transition um, from systems that have come past that used by date into the ones which can take us forward. And, and I know that's the work that we, with the Global Purpose Movement, are trying to contribute to and, and facilitate the most healthy transition into new forms of social and cultural structures that can support a new level of humanity's expression. <clears throat> yes, indeed we are. And you know, this kind of uh, race to the photo finish here between uh, devolution and evolution is definitely an exciting one and perhaps uh, also uh, plays into triggering people to finding a deeper purpose in their lives right now, you know, and I think we see more and more uh, people understanding that the materialistic paradigm isn't working, uh, is headed towards the dead end, and that maybe the meaning in their life uh, requires a little uh, more uh, heartfelt search to find a new, deeper purpose. Um, would you say that uh, that's actually bringing people to be more cognizant of their need to find purpose and connect with uh, higher consciousness as a result thereof? Yeah, I'd absolutely say that. And I think, you know, there's, it's often the case for individuals that, um, you know, they can be younger or they can be older, but, you know, there's a certain point in their lives often, not for everyone, but often, often for people who end up finding their way onto some path of transformation or, or self-development that they come to a point where they, they realize that the, their materialistic goals, the, the ambitions that may have been around material success, perhaps it was, you know, um, a, a particular job or a certain amount of money or owning a certain kind of car or, you know, whatever the example is that whatever they have projected to be the source of their fulfillment in a material way at a certain point is realized, oh, that actually, that doesn't bring me fulfillment in the way which I thought it might. And that begins and initiates a deeper search. And um, I think the same is true for humanity collectively right now, that, that that's part of the process that we're in, that um, there is increasingly a collective awareness that's dawning that the materialistic focus of our cultures and societies is not leading us to, you know, its promise of um, leading us to a truly fulfilled life is, is, it's not landing. And, you know, I think this is where it's, there's an important difference between the fact that it's absolutely right for us to recognize that um, a large number of people in the world today live in a, live in a situation of economic privilege as a result of the, um, the economic growth of our societies that are large, that an even larger number of people in the world don't have. You know, there's a vast number of people in the world who do not have the level of economic privilege that we predominantly in the West have. Um, and, you know, the, the focus on economic growth has, has in part at, the, at least contributed to the better living conditions that we now enjoy. But that, they don't necessarily lead to deep fulfillment as human beings. Right. And so, um, you know, that, that actually takes something more. And I think we're in the process of finding out what that means collectively. Yeah. Well, we are on this uh, search for deeper purpose in the global purpose movement. And you've uh, recently been very instrumental in designing an online course for the global purpose movement called Present Purpose and Passion. Uh, so I'd like to talk about that a little bit more and how that can help people find their purpose. Um, I guess, first of all, first question is, uh, I like alliteration too, but there's a lot of P words out there uh, beyond purpose, which uh, is central to our theme here. Uh, why did you choose present and passion? And how, how do you frame this uh, present pass pa purpose and passion course? Uh, for us in your own thinking. Yeah, sure. Um, the, the, the alliteration was a, a serendipitous, coincidental gift of uh, just, just bringing, these, bringing these points together that 
um, that I've learned in the work that I've done over the last six years. That in, in terms of the process that I feel called to, to facilitate um, for people I work with, whether it's groups or individuals, these three, um, uh, these three aspects, presence, purpose, and passion, have felt like the most important ones to cover. So um, the, the area of exploration that I've been involved in, that you know, it's, it's the area of exploration that we're involved in with the Global Purpose Movement, but that I've been exploring over the last six years and I feel called to play a role in is the, the integration of consciousness and action, of spiritual awakening and impact in the world. Um, and how people can translate a process of, uh, of, of interior meditative or prayerful or contemplative um, deepening insight into the deeper levels of our own being and, and a transformative process, how they can translate that into, um, into action in the world that contributes to and, and participates in the updating of our cultures and societies into a form that increasingly works for everyone but not in a way that you know it's based on anxiety or obligation i feel that there's so many people in the world today whose hearts and whose minds are open enough to have a, a deep sense of the interconnection of all human beings in the earth and who who feel the intense times that we're currently passing through who feel the deep challenges that and, and suffering that humanity is passing through right now and who deeply want to participate in in um in supporting our transition to, to a better future. But just being in contact with the news each day, being in contact with the daily realities of, of what we're collectively passing through at the moment can be very heavy and it can be very challenging and it can, it can feel like there's a lot of anxiety or sense of obligation that, that could drive someone's instinct to find their way into like, you know, what do I do? How do I participate? How do, how do I contribute to a better future for us collectively? So what I'm passionate about is doing work with people that supports their experience that it doesn't have to be that way, that actually their contribution can come from a place of inspiration and joy and exhilaration and aliveness. And that um, that's when people can connect to a sense of purpose. So to begin with presence, you know, for me, presence is, um, it's what I spoke to, what Dzogchen points to earlier on, and what a number of these traditions that focus on awakening point to, which is that when we let go and relax into the true nature of our own being, of our own ever-present consciousness and presence, um, there is an opening that can happen that allows us to recognize that the true nature of what we are is not separate from anything, and that is that it actually is um, it transcends and is intimately connected with everything in all creation. And for me, that's, that's, um, that's the deep place of sanity for us to be able to do, for us to be able to find and do our work in the world. And it's a place where we, we come from a place where we have no enemies. You know, we are not coming from a place of opposition. We recognize that the true nature of what I am is intimately connected with everything that's here. Um, and there is a, a fundamental freedom and wisdom and um, and presence, which is which is the basis of all of it. So that for me is the foundation. Presence is the foundation. And from that point, to connect to um, so what is the unique expression of that purpose of that presence, which is seeking to move through every person. And, what, and that's the place where, as I say, you know, it can be the place for a person where it's that which, in you know gives them their greatest sense of aliveness and fulfillment and it's also their greatest contribution to the whole are one so you know the people can find that their purpose is actually that place that turns to them on most and which is also their most powerful contribution to their families or their communities or their whatever their sphere of contribution is and passion is how how do they get creative with that in a way which is just exciting and inspiring and enlivening and, and do that consistently you know sometimes people can have um a temporary kind of flash of opening to to presence or they can have a temporary kind of sense of connection to oh i think this is my right purpose line or this is my right purpose line but it's a different thing to actually to open and, and flow with that so consistently that it's that you are living that each day on a sustained basis and and it is driving you, that there is such a sense of, um, you are in connection with your power. 
you're in connection with a with a stream of power um, and empowerment which is moving through your life which um, excites you sufficiently that you just have to do it and you're willing to take the steps you're willing to take the risks you're willing to um, be edgy and go beyond your own beyond your own edges sometimes to take it forward courageously in the world in a way that um, yeah can can contribute so as I say these three points presence purpose and passion in my work have really felt like key terms key key areas to support individuals to find their ability to contribute to the global change process process in a way that is exciting, enlivening, and fulfilling. Well, I can see that coming through very, very readily here. And so I think, uh, although you're very much an integral thinker, and I think all of these things that do arise simultaneously a little bit more in a linear concept for those people hoping to find their purpose is maybe the first step is establishing this presence, relaxing into it, as you say, just calming the mind, listening to the body, then your purpose starts to little by little reveal itself. And as it does, you automatically uh, gain passion and carry it forward. And, and therefore that kind of feeds back to your, your original presence and enhances that as well. Is that a fair description of the process? Absolutely. Absolutely, Manuel. Yeah. And can you give us a little bit more description of the course? <clears throat> How many sessions are there? How does it work? Uh, just give us a little more detail on, on the course. Sure thing. Uh, when so, so to a, just to give a broad kind of overview of how this connects to our work with the Global Purpose Movement, you know, so we um we feel that in terms of supporting and contributing to a large scale um updating of human culture and society it's key and important to support as many individuals as we can as we can work with to connect to their own sense of purpose and their own sense of presence their own sense of passion so that um people are then connected to their own um, to their own source of creativity and contribution to the world in a way that they're not relying on anyone else for that. They're connected, they're plugged in themselves, you know, and that that can be the basis for their creativity and contribution. So me running this course with the Global Purpose Movement is, um, is dedicated to having, you know, it's, it's, it's dedicated to outreach. It's dedicated to being able to um support a group of human beings to go through that process so we'll do it for five weeks it's going to be a five-week course um focusing on these areas and um yeah i'm, I'm confident that uh, that it's going to be good I'm, I'm i'm very i'm happy that we're, we're doing this and we have the opportunity to to broaden the the number of people that we're working with through, through working with on an online course format when the course start how can we sign up for it yeah, so, um, so the course begins on June the 11th. Um, and if you go to the Global Purpose Movement uh, website, which is um, it's globalpurposemovement.org, um, there is a, in the menu bar at the top, um, click on events. And uh, one of the events is the, is the five week uh, Presence, Purpose and Passion course, and you can register there. All right, well, very good. So as we move toward finding our purpose and embracing it, um, you know, a lot of people talk about having a purpose, like something you, you almost obtain, or maybe you can somehow even acquire or purchase sort of thing. So like it's uh, something you either have or have not. Um, but I know from a lot of your thought and my own discussions with you, I think uh, you feel that we can go beyond just having a purpose and actually get to a point of truly embodying that and perhaps be purpose itself rather than just having it. Uh, am I correct in that assumption? And would you like to uh, uh, riff off of that a little bit? My pleasure, Emmanuel. I feel, I feel, 
uh, grateful and excited by the questions that you're bringing to me. These are fun. Thank you. So, um, and just to say, I think, uh, I think our, our beloved teammate Carly um, just sent round the link to, uh, to the course to everyone in the chat box here. So um, for everyone on the call, if you want to know more about the course, check out the, the Zoom chat box and Carly sent a link there. So yeah, Emmanuel, I, I feel um, there are stages um, in people's connection to purpose in their lives. And, and that can begin with, um, often it begins for people with a sense of ambition. Um, they have various ambitions that, that again, often connect to some aspects of, of material success, whether it's um, some kind of achievement um, professionally, educationally, um, materially. And then there can be a process, I think, uh, more deeply than that, where people can connect to a sense of having a purpose, as you say, you know, having a, it's kind of like a, a deeper level of their own being starts to come online. And that's really this place that we talk about that where there can be an intersection of someone's what deeply fulfills someone to, to express and to give of their own being and their service and contribution to um to the whole whether it's their family their community as i say or, or more broadly um and yeah i i actually believe that there's there's a deeper place that can open up still from that where um we start to be a space through which purpose as as one frequency of uh, the presence that I mentioned earlier, one frequency of source, one frequency of, of, um, of the ground or, or ultimate essence of, of all things starts to express and move through our lives. Um, you know, I, I have come to feel that one way to talk about this is, you know, source or this, this reality, some traditions call it God, some traditions call it consciousness, some, you know, today more and more we have the idea in the scientific domain of this, um, of, of, of the quantum zero point and so on. You know, there's different ways that this is phrased, um, that it has different frequencies. You know, one frequency, for instance, is the intelligence that orders the cosmos and science is increasingly revealing that, that there seems to be an incredible intelligence at the basis of the structure of the cosmos. Um, and another frequency is love and wisdom and really the spiritual traditions over the course of history have pointed to how we can connect to that love and wisdom you know the christian communication that god is love is really a profound embodiment of that um but i think there can also come the recognition that this source reality is also purpose purpose is another frequency of it and my view is that social movements such as the global purpose movement and others that seek to draw upon this energy as the basis for collective transformation can be kind of petri dishes so there were you know experimental pods where people can yeah. learn to open more and more deeply to this energy and 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 as you say you know increasingly actually transition from a point where we don't just have a purpose that can stay that can remain but simultaneously we learn that at that deep level of our being, we are purpose, that, that there can be a stream of life force, of source life force that's moving through our being, which has its own intelligence and power and wisdom in terms of what it means to, um, in terms of what it means to unfold and to express more of the, the sacredness of what we are uh, individually, individually and collectively together. So. I think all purpose is, you know, people have many you know, different, different and unique expressions of purpose that the different people have. They may be focusing in different areas. They may be completely unique. And in a certain way, they're all, they're all the same. They're, they're all contributing to when it's at that level, at that kind of, at that level of having a purpose or kind of what I might call soul purpose, they're contributing to the, the unfolding and the actualization on a deeper level than is the case already of, of some aspect of an individual or a collective or an organization. They're all contributing to the, the, the empowerment of a deeper level of what's here. And that's what happens with being purpose as well, that there's this source energy that comes online to simply open more of what's here um, to, its, to its deeper and fuller expression. Well, thank you. That was beautifully said. I, you've definitely connected to your own thoughts there and got us on a very high frequency. So uh, I appreciate that. 
I believe there's some uh, questions from some of our listeners out there. We just have a, uh, about five, seven minutes left here, but maybe we can take a, a couple of questions. Uh, I saw one pop up from Teague uh, Alexander on the screen. I don't know if people have, let's try and uh, take a couple of questions and then we'll sum, wrap this up. Uh, is there anyone who'd like to ask something? Well, I can just I, there's, I can just jump in for this this, um, this question from T. Okay. She says, I feel like finding your purpose or what you're meant to do, uh, quote in quotes, often feels future oriented and mysterious. Do you feel like your purpose can change over time? My friend often asks, "What is my purpose right now?" And I've begun asking, "What am I called to be or do right now?" It seems to take the mystery and pressure off a bit. Thoughts and feelings. Um, yeah, I think I think this is an awesome. Um, this is an awesome question to you. Thank you. And I think it touches into a lot of really important topics around this whole area. I absolutely feel that, um, first of all, I absolutely feel like every human being does have a particular expression of authentic purpose and creativity, which, which is seeking to move through their lives. Um, every human being, I feel it's also a journey. And I think that, you know, sometimes can people can feel frustrated by the fact that it may not be immediately clear to them um, right now but it's a it's a journey i feel and um people it's a it's an incredibly fruitful journey for people to be in the exploration of connecting to their purpose and, and finding being in the discovery process over time i think it absolutely can change there can be different phases of people's expression of purpose with one beginning to open after the after the previous one fulfills itself um and i also think that it's good for us to have both a, a kind of more uh, long-term view of that and also a short-term perspective where am i right now what am i called to be or do right now because that you know that's beautiful there, there can be otherwise that we can disconnect ourselves from an intelligence and wisdom and compassion which is absolutely available to us in every single moment and which may be calling us to connect more deeply with this human being or take this action there or connect more deeply to the earth in some way whatever it might be that that's always alive and i, I absolutely agree it's it's good to it's really important to hold that that angle as well well thank you uh you have any other uh, questions there on your screen john uh there's, a, there's uh, a question from blake art or oh, blake art um i have a general statement that i can say over the can can you guys hear me yeah Hello. we can hear you yeah okay. yeah Mike. My uh, camera doesn't seem to be wanting to work, but uh, uh, anyway, okay. yeah, and, yeah, if you can hear me, it's, can hear better. Yeah. it's probably better you can't see me. Uh, yeah, uh, 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 Emmanuel, I met you at the IONS conference about two years ago. I remember you well, yes. Yeah, yes. how's it going? Thank and I think you. I met Andrea good. there as well. Were you there, Andrea? I can't remember. Okay, good. Yeah, I see you. Basically, let me give you a couple of observations. And uh, uh, John, this is a great thing that you're doing. I, you know, you talked about the dog chain. And I think that, you know, and I talked with uh, Julie Moss uh, about this as well. We're all kind of, you know, trying to figure out the puzzle of consciousness. And it's so deep and so in-depth that it's just hard to articulate. And uh, luckily, John, I, I have a sense of purpose because I've kind of discovered this part of consciousness, a part of the dog chin that you talked about earlier, that I'm trying to manifest into the physical realm so all of us can kind of participate and make the world a better place. And the way I can relate it to you guys that you'll understand, if you're familiar with Greg Braden and Bruce, Bruce Lipton's, Dr. Bruce Lipton's work about the imaginarial cells, uh, which all right. cells have. And, you know, consciousness is fractal and every part of consciousness works on a bigger, you know, to the size of the universe down to the, you know, quantum physics on the smallest level that we can perceive. You know, it's all kind of the same thing. We're, it's all different, but it's all the same, which is like the process of how fract fractals work. But, um, finding a purpose for us and our little group here of 12 participants. Um, if you're interested in learning more about my idea and I've kind of tried to pitch it at, at one point or another, and it's, again, it's very hard to articulate, but it's like merging a survey with the way imaginarial cells work in the body. 
uh, and it's applied to uh, our uh, economy and it's monetized. So, you know, there's all this feel good stuff about finding our own purpose and healing ourselves. And, you know, we, we generate this consciousness from within you know, we're not experiencing it with, without, and uh, we're spiritual beings having a physical existence, not physical beings having a spiritual existence. But what can we do that's concrete right now that is something that we can all uh, kind of form together and, you know, do the job of imaginary cells and saying, hey, here's the part that's sick. Here's where we need to draw attention to. And that's all I can, I mean, I'll cut myself off right there. Again, this is kind of a statement. But I would love to yeah. send you a, a link, uh, John, and maybe CC everybody. If you're interested in learning more about this idea, I've got a website. I've been meeting with a, a, a company out in California that's trying to help me get this thing off the ground. I've got a, a, another venture capitalist that's going to help me do this. So I've made a lot of progress since I've talked with you last, Emmanuel. And my yeah. email to contact me is blakeart at thejobspectrum, all one word, dot com. And right. uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be out in uh, Chicago uh, for the next two weeks, starting June 10th. And I'm going to check out the course at the global pur uh, purpose org and uh, maybe be able to uh, hang out with you guys uh, and uh, uh, participate in the course. And maybe the course could be something that could benefit from the knowledge I'm bringing to the table. So thank you for letting me chat. Yeah, you're very welcome. Well, here, send us uh, some uh, information in, on your stuff. We can uh, put it up. Maybe if you have a little blog or something about what you're doing, we'd glad to be glad to post it on Global Purpose uh, website and always glad to help. John, do you have any thoughts here to close the day on practical purpose? We can add another P in there and... Uh, Try and end on uh, any words of wisdom or advice you might have about how to put the higher consciousness in, into practice. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. So just something I'd, I'd answer quickly. Uh, David asked the question, how much is the course? What's the financial exchange for the five-week course? So uh, the financial exchange is uh, $125. Um, 125. Um, so yeah, that that's a financial change. We've looked to make it um, as accessible as, as possible. So, um, in relation to your question, Emmanuel, um, yeah, I think uh, so. My sense is that um, if if we all, if all individuals who feel called to contribute to or who, who feel a sense of deep care about our collective process going forward as, as humanity, um, trust that if I connect to my sense of right purpose and where that leads me to make my contribution, and you do the same, and we all as individuals do the same, then there's a natural process of self-organization that emerges in the whole where we all find our right place to make our contribution in a way where none of us necessarily have to bear the responsibility for all of it, and yet together we can, we can do what we want. Um, mm -hmm. So in terms of the, the practicalities of that, my sense is that I, I just invite everyone who's beginning to, to beginning to think about the subject or who's interested to go deeper with it to start to connect to what they feel passionate about and to, to feel open to trusting that, to, to yeah. feel open. Yeah. Uh, that being a signpost in their being so that there's something significant and important that can take them take them further in that direction and more along these lines is the type of stuff that we can we can explore in this this, this course very good yes well we certainly encourage everyone to to become an activist for their own purpose and for the purpose of one and all uh thank you jonathan darrell room for your Beautiful insights today, your help, your work to the world, your service to the global purpose movement. Thank you for being with us today. We really appreciate it and looking forward to working with you more. So this is Global Purpose Live. Stick with us every month. First Thursday of every month, we'll be interviewing uh, more luminaries of the purpose work. And thank you for joining us today. And I'll turn it back over to Andrea to wrap it up for now. Yeah, thank you to, to you, Emmanuel, as well, to John and to 
um, Teague and Blake for their contributions and for everyone for attending. I would just like to offer my email. I'm going to put it in the chat box if you have any comments or any areas for improvement or any potential speakers you'd like to see presented here on Global Purpose Live, we'd be welcome to receive your feedback and grateful for it. And if you'd like to sign up for the PPP course, you can do so on globalpurposemovement.com. And um, again, thank you so much for your time. Have a beautiful rest of your day. And that will um, close out today's Global Purpose Live. Very good. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye now. Bye, everyone.